Welcome to Circuit 42. Circuit 42. The one-stop location for all things geek. This episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham Newsstand. Sit back, relax, and most importantly, enjoy another episode of Circuit 42. Circuit 42. All right, everybody, welcome to the newest episode of Cosplay Circuits. I am here with our special guest, cosplayer and juggling extraordinaire, Elisa Espinoza. Hi. Is it true that you are a juggling extraordinaire, or is Ian full of shit? Am I a juggling extraordinaire? No, I actually have not really juggled at all. <laughs> yeah, when I, was a, um, when I was little, me and my dad, I, I think I was like three or four, and I was already mastering trolling which was great, mm -hmm. um, because what we would do, I would get, um, my dad would tell everyone, yeah, yeah, my son could juggle, and we'd just get it going, and get an ability building up, and then I would come over, I would get ready, and say, here, here, let's show him, and he would like, like oranges or whatever, mm -hmm. and he said, okay, you ready, thump, 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 and I wouldn't even move my hands at all, they were on my sides yeah. the whole time. And I was, me and my dad were laughing, and everyone would just be confused. <laughs> and, I've attempted to juggle a couple of times, and I've gotten probably a good three catches, and then I end up throwing them really far away, and I'm just like, yeah, I can't do this. <laughs> I just remember it was an interview with Ellen Page, where she says, oh, I can juggle too. And all of a sudden, they 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 bring out something for her to juggle and say, so we totally didn't know this was going to happen. Here you go. <laughs> and she just starts juggling in the middle of an interview. Nice. <laughs> all right, so speaking of juggling, who are you and what do you do? Well, obviously, my name is Elisa Espinosa. Uh, outside of cosplaying, I'm actually a gas station attendant at a local Costco. Um, nice! Other than, that, other than that, I one day hope to eventually become a veterinarian. That is really cool. Um, so, in regards to um, in regards to cosplay, like, how did you get started? Well, I've always been very into anything involving art. I always loved dressing up. I was in theater class while I was in high school. And, of course, Halloween has always been my favorite holiday. So I actually, one of my um, first, I guess you could say, cosplays was um, a simple little costume I had bought from the Halloween store. It was American McGee's Alice. And I went to, I believe it was Comic Con, New York Comic Con of 2012. And I had a lot of fun there. And from there, I just kicked off of uh, the I would constantly come up with different costume ideas while I was at work because I mean we work we walk in a square for like eight hours a day you tend to have a lot of thinking time a special guest has appeared I can't believe you didn't even name tell us there's gonna be another guest <laughs> random barking dog oh yeah <laughs> So for the for those who are wondering, and I think pretty much everyone is wondering, what kind of dog do you have? What kind of dog? Um, it's actually my roommate's dog. Her name is Jada, and she is. A... Are you there, Lisa? Yeah. Did it fade out? Yeah, you said my it's my roommate's dog, and then. Oh, all right. Sorry about that. Um, her name is Jada, and she's a blue nose pit. Oh, that's awesome. Pits are, pits are mm -hmm. cute dogs. They always get bad reputations. Because of, like, I know. People. It's, it's so saddening. And, like, they are the sweetest... Well, any animal, really. They are just the sweetest things in the world. Uh, Jada, whenever I come home, she's always waiting at the door for me. And as soon as I open the door, she's doing backflips and just oh. jumping and doing these little happy dances. She's just the sweetest little thing. That's so cute. Now mm -hmm. you you mentioned uh you mentioned Alice earlier. We actually had American McGee on as a guest last year. Nice. Yeah, he was really really cool. I uh, didn't know what to expect at all because, um, like something weird about him that people most people don't know is that American is actually his real name. Oh really? But Interesting. apparently his parents were going to name him Obar. 
Okay. And chose to become American instead. Hmm. And dur- so during the show, I just said, um, that eh, could be worse. They could have named you Obar. <laughs> and I loved his response. He just said, parents, future parents, this is why you don't name your children when you're high. <laughs> Fantastic. I think that is the best best thing he could have said right there. <laughs> so, um, now you said that your first costume was um was Alice. Did this kind of kickstart did this kind of kickstart interest in cosplay? Or is it one of those where you dress up in the costume and then you really started getting the cosplay later on? It was probably one of those things where I dressed up and then really got into it later on because upon going to Comic-Con and seeing just the environment and just seeing all the different costumes and all the work that some of these people really put into them, it it was just such an amazing experience. And I was like, I could really see myself doing something like this as kind of like an escape from, you know, the real world and the struggles of adulthood. (laughs) And everything like that. Um, what really made me go and get serious about this was when I had put together my Harley Quinn cosplay. Now, I also used to do some volunteer work at the New York Renaissance Fair up in Tuxedo. And the one year, I decided I'm going to wear my Harley Quinn costume there. And just the reaction of all these children just being so excited to take pictures with me and just seeing the smiles on their faces. I was like, you know what? I could really get into this. I could really do this. So something I've got to ask, like with regards to Harley Quinn, now especially with Suicide Squad coming out, there is this research interest in the character. Like the character's always been popular. But now we're hitting mm-hmm. what I call a um, Deadpool demic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where all of a sudden everyone, everyone's a Harley Quinn fan. Everyone's cosplaying as Harley yeah. Quinn. Yeah. And um, what is your opinion of this? Because I know that you, you and I have talked, and you and I, you were actually going as Harley Quinn for a while before this became a thing. And uh, what's it like seeing the character become so popular among cosplayers? It's definitely, um, it's definitely interesting. Uh, I think it's actually pretty good. Like, I always thought the Harley Quinn was just a very interesting character with, um, her, I guess you could say, inner kind of fight with, well, if you actually read, like, the comics and everything like that. First she started out just devoted to the Joker, just wanting to do everything for the Joker. But then after a while, and especially becoming friends with Ivy, she started um, trying to become her own person. And I guess, in a sense, you can kind of say that it is a little bit of a um, good example for some some women out there who, um, see themselves in, like, relationships like that. Yeah. But it's, I do think it's very interesting. I was very shocked, though, when I started going to the store and just seeing, like, Harley Quinn stuff everywhere. I was just like, what? Where was all this when I was little? And, like, wanted to dress up in Harley Quinn-themed shirts and all this type of things. I remember, like, when DC first started doing the DC Universe figures. It's mm. like, it was like the first Harley Quinn figure in like 10, in like 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I snapped that up right away, because I'm like, yeah, I should probably get this right now. Yeah. Because I haven't seen a Harley Quinn figure in years, and then you look at what happened. Yep. It, yeah. It's... It's definitely interesting. Like, I remember, I mean, even though I'm not exactly that old, but I remember back when I was little, you know, it wasn't, not necessarily that it wasn't okay, but it wasn't very popular for you to, like, be nerdy or read comics or anything like that, especially if you were a girl. Nowadays, since everyone reads comics or 
is into superheroes or video games, it's become a lot more socially acceptable. And a lot of people actually, like, like it now. Now they're, like I said, especially, I think that's probably also why I really wanted to get into cosplaying, because of the community of just a bunch of, basically just a bunch of people with nerdy intent. And it's so funny, like, with me, the moment I got my first apartment, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to geek this place out. And mm-hmm. I got, I got these big bookshelves from Ikea. I put up all my comics, my movies, special stuff. Like, I've still got my Resident Evil Chainsaw Control and some Spawn figures. I had them all set up. And it was right right after the first Iron Man came out. And people were still not totally in the whole comic book thing yet. And I would get friends who would kind of be like, oh, that's silly. Or most of them would get it because most of them were cool. But, you know, you'd mm-hmm. occasionally get that one person. But then about a year or two later, like people would just come into my house and be like, this place is amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, um, there was a friend of mine and his girlfriend, she came in and she actually asked if she could look at some comics, because apparently she'd been wanting to get into comics, and she, and I told her, yeah, I kind of consider this like a little library, when you're here, read whatever you want. And That's... it's so, so funny watching it, watching the shift. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's great. Like, like I said, I remember when I was, when I was younger, I've always been into comic books. I've never been, like, the girly girl type of person. And, unfortunately, during the younger age, I didn't really exactly, I wasn't really popular, or I wasn't really in any kind of big groups of friends because of that. Because people thought it was silly, and uncool, and all this type of stuff. So now... You know, once I got into high school, once playing video games and everything started being more socially acceptable, I ended up having, like, this giant group of people that now, like, once a week, we all get together, sit down, we play Super Smash Brothers. You know, have a couple drinks, and we just have a fun time. You have no idea how extremely relatable this is for me. (laughs) Because <laughs> you just, like, lined up my... You just, like, synced up with my, like, childhood growing up. <laughs> but uh, I was lucky, because even though when I was in high school, it was, like, 2000-something, like, early 2000s, and the whole thing hadn't really... The whole comic bubble hadn't kind of reinflated, which I really think it has, I think. Because you know how back in the 90s you had the whole, I've got 8 billion copies with 17 variant covers, it's got to make a million dollars. And everyone was buying it, but they were buying it for shallow reasons. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was a bunch of shitty comics being sold for shallow reasons. Nowadays, yeah. we're in kind of a much better version of that. Like, you don't get the millions and millions of sales, but people are actually buying them because they want to read them. They're buying them because they're interested. And mm-hmm. the companies are realizing, oh shit, people are interested outside of our usual fan base who will buy these up either way. We mm-hmm. better make some good-ass comic books. And all of a sudden, you've got this huge variety of work that's being bought by a lot of people, and it's very cool. Yeah, especially now with all the different universes and all the different timelines and stuff that they're going with. Um, like, when I saw that they uh, did a... Uh, I, I didn't read too much in it, into it, but I guess it's Thor's sister or the female Thor or whatever it is that they're doing with that. I was like, that's that's interesting. That's definitely something different. That's new. I could see, like, at least reading it to see how that goes. I was originally from uh, Arizona, okay. and um, a lot of people are from, a lot of cosplayers, like big cosplayers come out of Arizona, like Jessica Negri is from there, uh, okay. Karen Nicole is from there, Tony Darling's from there, and Tony Darling was actually the female Thor, the one that got all nice. over the internet, and it was, nice. it was a perfect example of what people like to pretend doesn't exist, kind of the sexism in the fan community where people started doing the Photoshop where it said stuff like horror and shit like that. It's like, what the fuck, people? And um, she thought it was really cool that, you know, there, there is a, that they were actually, a female Thor did come out of all that. Although we always joke that our Thor back in Arizona was better. <laughs> but um, she just thought that was really neat that apparently, she said you probably wasn't them looking at her picture. But it was kind of cool to know that you had that, that was out there. Yeah. But, um... 
yeah, what what I was what I was saying earlier was that in my high school we kind of lucked out because the two most popular kids in school were a football player who loved Army of Darkness, Dungeons and Dragons, Monty Python, and comic books. Nice. <laughs> and the other super popular kid who's also a giant nerd, and so it had this <laughs> trickle down effect, where I I think I compared it once to the high school from Twenty One Jump Street. <laughs> Where, like, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's cool, that's neat. Like, stuff that you would never, ever think was going to be accepted. And it seems like that mentality has really kind of become widespread. Yeah, it's great. I remember the first time I ever started getting into playing, like, uh, like card games. first one I played was... Um, I played Yu-Gi-Oh! for a short amount of time, and then I really got into playing Magic the Gathering. When I went to go play Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know, I was, let's see, I was probably like a freshman in high school or something like that. So I never had gone to like a comic shop to actually do any type of semi-competitive gaming in terms of cards. So when I got there, I was expecting, you know, just you, the stereotypical nerds. When I got there, I saw quite a lot of people that was like, wow, I would not expect you to be a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan if I just saw you, like, in school or on the street or something like that. And I was like, that's really cool. I really like that. Because I, ha I had just the fear that I was like, oh, I'm going to be the only girl. I'm going to stand out. <laughs> it's going to be awkward. And thankfully, it wasn't. It was... It was very interesting, it was a very good experience, and that's probably what really made me get into, like, playing Magic the Gathering and stuff like that. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, and this actually relates perfectly to this, um, one of the reasons that we have, co well, one of the reasons that we've had cosplay circuits as one of our series, not just to get to know cosplayers and talk to them on the show, but also, when, it's, it always seems like a lot of people I know go to conventions, there's like that weird, almost barrier between them and the cosplayer. Like they feel like they can't make more, more than like five words with them. They get nervous, and, or or it's like, oh, okay, take your picture, and then bolt. They leave instead of like mm -hmm. feeling like they can actually be comfortable talking to people. Um, part of the reason that we came up with the show was to basically show that people are people. You know, just because they're wearing a costume doesn't mean you you can't talk to them and can't relate to them. Yeah, and um. Uh, there was one. There was one person we had on here. Uh, I think it was actually Ivy Doom Kitty, where she talked about how, yeah, you know, she wasn't the most popular girl in school. She had trouble talking to guys. The guys wouldn't talk to her, and all this other stuff. And she basically said, you know, never. Uh, she said, you know, she said two things: never assume that that per that 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 you can't speak to the said person or whatever like that. Because she said that was a lot of what she went through in high school as people. Not necessarily people assume, like they would assume that they couldn't, they didn't want to talk to her in school, and then they assumed that they couldn't talk to her at conventions, at conventions and yeah. shows. And um, I think people don't understand that, like, we're all, like, when it comes to the, like, the, art, the arts and the different fields, we all have that little bit, we all have at least a little bit of that kind of nervousness. You know, everybody, everybody wants, wants to be, there are some people who don't want to be. But everyone wants to be approached by someone who just wants to have a normal conversation. You know? Yeah. I mean, hell, I still get nervous with things like that. I'm still kind of sort of socially awkward and things like that, believe it or not. Um, I, I still personally find it a little hard to talk to some, to some new people. When I meet new people, like if I'm out going to a party or something with friends... I still find it hard to actually just jump in and start talking to people. For the most part, I find it more comfortable to talk to people while in costume. Or even something like this, because I know a lot of people, I know some people I'm friends with, I would not be, I would not be able to push them nearly as easily if I hadn't talked to them on Facebook or on Skype or something like that prior. Mm. Like, there was a cosplayer friend of mine who... I've been talking to her for a while, and she moved from Mississippi to um, Austin. If you know who uh, Kimi Hako Blade is, I do not. I'm terrible with names. <laughs> um, she's a really good cosplayer, and she had moved from Mississippi to Austin. And I just said, "Hey, um, do you want? We're talking about doing an interview. 
you're in Texas now. Do you just want to do a live interview? And we were going to, then we just started hanging out and, like, eating food and stuff. And I said, decided, oh, we can hold off on it, but let's just hang out and spend the day together. And we ended up becoming, we ended up becoming friends, not just online, but in person. And I think that would have been a lot more difficult to do if we had not talked. Like, got not, not talked or got to know each other on Facebook or stuff like that. And, I don't know, do you think social media actually has helped kind of bridge that gap? Um, yeah, I believe that, um, social media does help a bit with helping people open up to starting new conversations, because I, even I, I, like I said, I still am a little socially awkward, I still have a little bit of trouble, like, just right out starting talking to someone face to face, I I don't really know how to explain it too well, but I guess it's kind of sort of like when you talk to someone via text or something like that, there is a little bit of like, I want to say kind of like a mask, so to speak. It just kind of gives you that little bit more confidence to just say what you're thinking. It's almost like a social cushion, yeah? Yes. Yes. The uh, the problem is though at, at the same like this is just my opinion there's also that negative of it where um, you have like like the creators of Henry Arcade termed coined the greater internet fuckwad theory. You mm. have you heard of that? I have not. Basically, what it was. Let me see if I can find it. The greater internet fuckwad theory, which is still the greatest name for anything. <laughs> I'm pretty sure just from what I'm describing you're kind of already getting an idea. Basically, they have this thing where it says, um, person with opinion plus anonymity, plus technology plus anonymity equals shitcock. And basically <clears throat> saying that you have a person who, without that person there, without having someone around, they feel like they can say whatever they want. Mm. Oh, here it is. Unreal Tournament 2004 lends incontrovertible proof to John Gabriel's greater internet fuckwad theory. Normal person, which is normal, happy, smiling guy, plus anonymity, question mark, plus audience, three stick figures, equals total fuckwad. And now he's got his tongue out, looking, yeah, his tongue's out, and it says, shit cock. <laughs> but, um, I don't know, that's just my opinion, that at the same time, the other... You always have the other side of the coin. Yeah, I mean, there is always going to be someone out there that doesn't agree with something. Like, you're never going to... No one is ever going to always have the same opinion of you. And it is kind of shitty that you see a lot of people on social media, like the cyberbullying thing. That is really shitty. It, it does... It, it's disappointing that bullying in general exists. And... I mean, it, um, unfortunately, it's just something that's always going to be there. And a lot of pe I feel like a lot of people just need to know, you know, you're your own person. You do what makes you happy. And you shouldn't really acknowledge any of these bullies that really just say things to get attention. And then that kind of brings you into that kind of, it, bring, it kind of brings you once again into another area where, you know, we have a situation where, you know, most normal people like you and me are like, you know what? That person said something kind of douchey. Whatever. I'm going to go live my life. But then you go into the, but then you go to a lot of people who are becoming more and more visible who are like, oh my God, that person said something. Um, they should be banned from the internet forever because my feelings were hurt. Yeah. But I, that's something we see a little bit of today. Yeah. I feel like, uh, a lot of uh, society has become a little bit too sensitive on some things. And it's just like, you know, like I said, everyone is going to have their own op opinion. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. You're not going to agree with it. That's just, that's life. That's just how it is. You can't really just censor or punish people necessarily for having an opinion that you don't agree with. Yeah, and then, I mean, the fact that there's actually, you know, we won't say her name because it's someone whose name should never be said in Circuit 42. A certain someone who's trying to actually get 
people who say mean things to her and people on Twitter, like, completely banned from Twitter? Oh. Yeah. I think we both know the name of the person that I'm talking about. Yeah, this is the same person who went in front of the government and basically wasted and wasted people's time because people hurt her feelings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She she's at it again, mm-hmm. and try and they've actually got people seriously considering this because she don't want her feelings hurt on the internet. Well then, <laughs> it's a the... weird, it's a weird time. It's like you you can't go through life, you know. Like at the same time, while it does bring some good things, it does bring it brings awareness. You know, people are a little more aware. That's definitely good. You you need that, but you also need that balance. You know, people can't be so worried that they're afraid to say or do anything. You know? Yeah. See, this, at least uh, you just need to represent the internet as a whole. You know that, right? <laughs> just be like, I understand. My feelings were hurt, too. I could, lo- I could go over here and be like, fuck yeah, these people are cool. Let's hang out with these people and not with douchebag. Instead yeah. of, let's focus on douchebag. Yeah. It, like, I mean, I, throughout high school, I was friends with a bunch of different people from different cliques, so to speak. But for the most part, the people that I really got close to and really consider to be, like, people that I can see as sort of like my family were people who were considered the misfits, the underdogs, the outcasts, all that type of stuff. Like, that type of group. Because, I mean, I don't know, I feel like the people who are more so, like, popular, so to speak, are really judgmental on how you should look, or if you have money, or things like that. And honestly, that's really a bad way to judge people. You know, like, you should judge someone based on the type of person they are. I remember I ended up, there was a picture of me at a convention with these two cosplayers. And it was this great picture, and everyone was commenting on it. And then my friend tells me that apparently it ended up on 4chan. Oh. But here's, but he told he told me about it, and he said, he said you're not bothered by any this? No, it's fucking funny. <laughs> and so the fact that this picture of me just being awesome just ends up on 4chan and like half apparently half the people were giving me shit because 4chan. Yeah. But like they're saying, Oh, it's just some dude with with girls pretending to like him. And um somebody else somebody else came on there and said, Okay, you guys were all sitting at your computer. <laughs> Not doing anything. Not going out there. Not going to conventions. Not getting, taking pictures of girls at conventions. And this guy's going out there. He is one step, several steps above almost every single one of us here, me, myself included. And I just thought that was so awesome that somebody saw through that and was like, yeah, you people are pretty fucking lame. But I thought it was great that my friend thought I would be bothered by it. Yeah, it's like, awesome, apparently I'm infamous. Rock on. <laughs> um, the, the, it seems like all the bullies of the world have disappeared from, like, real life, and all of them are hiding in the internet now, because they realize it's yeah. not socially acceptable to do, it, to do it outside. Yeah. All right, so... Uh, what other what other costumes have you had that people might know you for? Because you talked about your Harley Quinn cosplay, and you've talked about your first costume, the uh, Alice one. Like, are there, are there any other cosplays that you really like that you've done? Um, well, since I'm really new, honestly, to the cosplaying thing, the only other costumes I have were, um, this past, well, this past February I went to, uh, uh, Wicked Fair, which is something that's more local toward me. To me, I had a burlesque poison ivy costume that I had put together. Um, I also did do a Catwoman, which I had also worn to last year's Comic Con. Um, what else have I done? I did a Red Sonia for Comic Con. That's awesome. You don't see Red Sonia much. 
Yes. Which was, I was su- super excited to put it together, though it was extremely tedious because I had basically woven my own scale mail. Yeah. And sewn it to a bra, and upon doing that, I was like, oh my god, why? Why is this taking so long? Why is this so so tedious? But in the end, it was definitely very, it was worth it. I had a lot of fun doing it, and it was just, something's just so, um, ah, uh, so good to say that you, like, you built it yourself. It's a, it's a, it's a, and from, you know, not from my personal experience, obviously, but from other people I've known who've gone as a character, it's kind of like Vampirella, that, or Vampirella Lady Death, and that it's a costume that's not easy to pull off at a convention, or an event. Yeah, you could say that. It's definitely, it definitely takes a hell of a lot of confidence to be able to walk around like that. I'm not gonna lie. I was kind of nervous to to wear it, yeah. but I had I had a lot of fun doing so. I have a friend of mine. She's she made a vampirella costume. She got the whole thing done. She literally can't wear it to shows at all. Wow. Yeah, because I think the most polite way to put it is that because of her body type, she would just like fall out of the costume. Ah. Yeah. Yes, that's. That is a very difficult issue. But um, with that, you were talking about how you were how you've been into comics and everything for a while. Uh, like, what is what, do, what titles are you reading right now? Um, I honestly at the moment haven't really read anything. Uh, when I was playing Magic, I would read Lady Death. I was also reading um, I believe it's Grim Fairy Tales. Oh. Dude, I'm actually friends with uh, Raven Gregory. He's another Arizonan. The guy who did nice. uh, Grim's Fairy Tales and those back when Zetascope was doing really well. Nice. Yeah. I hate to say it, but it seems like right when they got rid of Raven Gregory, that whole company just kind of kind of plummeted. Mm. Hear that, Zetascope? Yeah, that... You're not doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I haven't really read too many comics because I just... Really haven't had the time between uh, working and then trying to get all these cosplays um, done. That's really where most of my time goes. Either way, you know that's pr- that is really cool, and it is nice to see. To um, I think a lot of people they have this assumption that people for some reason they have this assumption about cosplayers that they don't actually read the comics or whatever or don't know the source material. And it's like. That's kind of a shitty assumption to make. Yeah. I got actually got banned by um, by a comic book artist from his Facebook page. He's the guy who drew Ex Machina and a bunch of other stuff. Because I tagged him on an article where he had actually said that cosplayers were quote unquote trying to trick male you know, comic book fans. Well. Yeah. That's... He doesn't work a lot anymore. Ah, I see. <laughs> yeah, weird, right? How, like, being the sexist weirdo kind of reduced the amount of jobs that you get? Yeah, that's, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> but I'm actually glad that people reacted the way they did. They basically said, yeah. that all of a sudden, all of those calls stopped coming. That's, that's good in a sense. <laughs> I guess but, not good for him, but... <laughs> well, yeah, but it also it also shows that, you know, that, you know, in that field that that shit doesn't fly. You know? Yeah, and it, it shouldn't. You know, if, if someone wants to cosplay as a character, let them cosplay as a character. No matter what, I guess, level of knowledge of that character they have. Yeah, there was, yeah. um, was it, uh, the, the YouTuber Alpha Omega Sin? He did a cosplay video that got him a lot of angry comments because he said, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Trying to tell people that they can't dress up because they can't answer ten fucking trivia questions for you. Who gives a shit? And he he said I I he he said I was at a convention and I met like an Agent Forty Seven who just looked like Agent Forty Seven, and he told me that he didn't really play any of the games. I told him I don't fucking care. You look great. Good job. Yeah. Because he told him that he it was the character brought to life for him, and he said that was a, lot, a fuck of a lot more important. Whether this guy knew every single question about Hitman. Yeah. And I think 
that's a message that is getting out more and more and more because you you're seeing less of this, and that's people good. are just. It does seem like there's a level. There is a level of respect, and a level of respect and common sense that wasn't there. It's still. I personally still think think it's something that needs to grow a little bit, but it's definitely gotten better. What do you think? Sorry, I talk a lot. No, it's okay. I, I do think that it is getting better where now the people people aren't really judging too much on uh, knowledge-wise of characters. Like, um, I remember seeing uh, one one picture on Facebook. I think it was like a silly little comic, you know, of like Rogue and Gambit and a couple of the other X-Men. Uh, Rogue was screaming, like, who touched my butt? And you saw Wolverine, Cyclops, and Gambit saying, you know, not me, but Gambit was like really skinny as if, you, you know, uh, how Rogue steals powers and whatnot. And there was just like, everyone was arguing about whether or not that was true and how, like, some people were saying Gambit's immune and all this type of stuff, and it's just like, why is everybody getting so uptight about this? This is unnecessary. It's supposed to be a, a comic as a joke. Take it as a joke and, you know, leave it at that. Like, why do you have to sit there and call people names based on whether or not they actually, like, know exactly what happened and all this type of stuff? Especially because of all the different comic lines and everything, and different twists in the different uh, universes and worlds. Yeah, like there's there's a lot out there. Like I I'll be the first person to say that I don't know a lot about the current the uh, current X Men stuff because it was not the stuff I really grew up reading. I grew up with from like the eighties to around the two thousand early two thousands, but I don't know shit about Secret Wars. I I don't know what the fuck is going on. No. <laughs> Do I? I don't think the readers know what the fuck is going on with Secret Wars. <laughs> it's like apparently uh, this character's still around because Hawkeye sold really well. So yeah, this character's <laughs> not because of the sales. It's uh, yeah, it's insane. I, it's I, like sorry. sorry. <laughs> and it's like some of the comics were like well. Uh, one of the comic, uh, one of the comments I saw on it was like, "Well, since no one else here is a true nerd and all this type of stuff," and it's just like, "Whoa, what? What does that even mean? A true nerd? Like, it's uh, like how, my how glasses do you... are thicker than yours, sir. I am a true <laughs> nerd." <laughs> right? It's like I don't even. I, where do you even come up with that term? <laughs> You know, there's so many different things out there that are considered nerdy or part of, like, a geek, the geek community. It's like you have anything from, uh, the, anything from like, sci-fi to comics to fantasy. You know, how do you, with all these different categories, how do you determine what's true or not? Yeah, like... I mean, perfect example, uh, my girlfriend, she's really, really huge in Star Wars science fiction. She's never really read, got an opportunity to read a lot of comics. Um, we started talking about comics, she's, she started reading more and more and more and getting into them. And it seems like nowadays there's this whole this thing that people don't seem to understand where it's an opportunity for people to, to get people interested in comic books to be like, oh, you like that in the movie, here's a comic you might like. And it almost seems like a lot of people don't understand that or are almost rejecting it, where it's like, well, if you weren't a comic book fan first, then what's the point? It's like, people want to check it out. You know? There's an interest there. And if you push people away and, if you push people away and treat them like they don't know anything because they didn't read issue number 506 of Uncanny X-Men Volume 2, then all you're going to do is continue pushing people away and isolating the community. Yeah, which is absurd. Yeah. yeah, I think in many ways this is something, one of those things that people need to hear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's, like we said, it's getting better, but it's still at a point where people don't seem to completely get it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you don't have to like every comic book. You don't have to like every superhero. I mean, me personally, I might get some hate for this, but I don't really care about Superman. (laughs) I personally am not that big on the heroes. I don't hate them. But I do lean more toward, like, the villains or anti-heroes, things like that. Those just interest me more. Yeah. I mean, my whole thing is that every character has a good story. Or it can have a number of good stories. So I've yeah. never really latched onto one particular character, except maybe Kitty Pryde and Batman. Which is, like, the complete opposite as far as spectrum for the characters. But, um... Like, for example, one of my friends... They said the same thing to you. They said, oh, you know, I don't like Superman. I said, oh, that's perfectly fine. Now, yeah. I said, but if you want to get the stories that make... But I tell them, if you want the stories that want make people like Superman, and you want to get them to try and see why people like him, read All-Star Superman, Superman Birthright, and Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. Yeah, like, that's my thing. That, you know, every character has good and shitty stories. But the yeah. really good stories are the ones that are going to make you realize why people love these characters. Yeah. And I just saw recently on Facebook where apparently DC was making, uh, or someone was making fuck you Marvel shirts. And people were wearing them. And it's just like, that's kind of childish like that's kind of unnecessary why do you have to split up the marvel for the dc you know whoever likes what can like whichever i mean you know there's i like characters from both and why do you have to kind of like make it that you have to choose one or the other (laughs) And then the one thing that's worse, and I, and I, I don't know, that's as bad, and I, I love the Marvel movies, I love the DC movies, you know, they both, they're both good for different ways. Yeah. Because when you have the professionals, like the people in the industry who started doing this, like, what was that whole thing recently where, um, you know, they started talking about how there is a under, basically an unrated director's cut that's basically our rate of Superman and Batman. And the guys over at, uh, was it... The directors, uh, James Gunn and the director of Ant-Man, started joking around saying, oh, there's an NC-17 version of Ant-Man, and making fun of DC, and it's like, really? All you're doing, you're a professional. Don't stir the pot. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad it's not the studio doing that, but at the same time, if I was a producer, I'd be like, what the fuck, people? You know, this is not professional. I mean, we want to come off as professional. Because yeah. that's the, something I'll give to DC, at least, is that the people behind the studios are not doing that. You know, they're basically saying, you know, we're just making a movie. Who cares? I, I really... It's one of those things where I don't want to say that I want someone to get in trouble, but I really hope that one of the heads of Marvel's like, yeah, we can't... We don't do that. We don't insult the other studios for something they said. Yeah. Because all that does is really encourage you know, what you were talking about. You know, encourages the it encourages the fans, especially, especially what I called the Facebook fans, to um to do the exact same thing because they're like, oh, okay, they did it, so it's okay. Yeah. So with that, is there anything else that you want to talk about before we bring the show to a close? Um, nothing that I can necessarily think of at the time. Awesome. Well, with that, well as well as we bring this episode to a close, where can people find you? Um, unfortunately, I mainly resign in Jersey, so... Well, not, no, um, no, not the stalkers, just the people online. Uh, <laughs> I thought you meant for, like, cons and stuff. Um, uh, well, that too. My Facebook, my Facebook page, uh, I have a separate Facebook account solely for all my cosplay stuff, which is, um, it's gonna be my name, Elise Espinosa, but it'll be me as Harley Quinn. I also have my cosplay page, which is a Sirens Cosplay. And, um... I do have a Twitter. No, no, I'm sorry. Not Twitter. Uh, Instagram. Instagram. Uh, I believe that one is Undead Oracle. 
That is really cool. And with that, did you have anything else you wanted to mention at all before we bring the show to a close, or should we bring the show to a close? We can bring it to a close. Awesome. Well, with that, this is the newest episode of Cosplay Circuits. We are here with our special guest, Elisa Espinoza. Elisa? Oh, sorry. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> Make sure to check her out on the Eterna webs and go to all the things. Have a good night, everybody. You've been listening to Circuit 42, brought to you by Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham Newsstand. Join us for our next episode for all things geek. Circuit 42.